So ACE inhibitors, captopril, enlapril, ramipril, lisinopril, perintopril, all are the examples for ACE inhibitors. So we know the mechanism of action of ACE inhibitors. They mainly block the angiotensin converting enzyme. By blocking the angiotensin converting enzyme, they prevent the formation of angiotensin 2. Okay. So the advantages of using the ACE inhibitors are ACE inhibitors, especially in heart failure, they prevent cardiac remodeling. So cardiac remodeling is a condition where cardiac myocytes, that is the cardiac muscles, after myocardial infarction, that is after heart attack, or after congestive heart failure, that is heart failure, our current topic. Okay, So cardiac myocytes, they change in their size, they change in the mass, and they change in the function. Okay, So their size, shape, and the function will be changed. Okay, So for, uh, ultimately, or finally, it leads to cause a decrease in the function and Fun it leads to cause a decrease in the function of the ventricles and it may lead to cause the ventricular arrhythmias in the patient. Okay, So that condition is known as the cardiac remodeling. So I will explain you in detail with the diagram in the next slide. Okay, And by putting the patient on an ACE inhibitor, so if, if a patient has the heart failure problem and if we put the patient on the ACE inhibitor, then this ACE inhibitors they prevent such cardiac remodeling. That is, they prevent change in the size, shape, mass, and the functions of the heart. So if, if that changes occurs, then the heart will develop a new problem, which is known as the arrhythmias. So from heart failure condition, the patient will end up with another problem, and that problem is known as the cardiac arrhythmias ventricular arrhythmias okay. and so that's the main reason why we must put the patient on ACE inhibitors and then the ACE inhibitors they also uh, enhance the renal blood flow they improve the renal blood flow so and ACE inhibitors they prevent the diabetic nephropathy so that's the another reason why in all the diabetic patients the main drug of choice. Okay, so the main drug of choice is they put the patient on ACE inhibitors. So ACE inhibitors are considered as the first line agents in diabetic patients because ACE inhibitors they prevent diabetic nephropathy in the patients. And then ACE inhibitors they have a capacity to regress left ventricular or the vascular hypertrophy. So ACE inhibitors are considered as the first line drugs in patients with myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure, or coronary artery disorders. So as already we have covered in our previous topics, so whenever the patient have any of the other cardiovascular problems, so if a patient is a diabetic, uh, sorry, if a patient is a hypertensive patient, along with hypertension, if the patient has any other problems like myocardial infarction, that is heart attack, or congestive heart failure, or uh, angina pectoris, so any other problems, then ACE inhibitors are to be considered as the first line agents in the patient. Okay. Now, regarding the ventricular remodeling, that as we have seen here, ACE inhibitors they prevent cardiac uh, remodeling. Okay, so that is ACE inhibitors they prevent the left ventricular hypertrophy. So what is meant by this cardiac remodeling? What is meant by the left ventricular hypertrophy? So in this diagram, we can have a look through this diagram. Okay? So this is the normal size of the heart, normal shape of the heart. So here in this normal heart, so we can see the size of the left ventricle. But here on the right hand side, you can see uh, the left ventricle has undergone hypertrophy. That is the enlarged in size. So what happened here is, here, the left ventricular size, shape, and ultimately the function has been changed. Okay, so the size, shape, and its function has been reduced. Okay, so the size and shape have increased, and its function has been reduced. Okay, so what happens 
exactly here is. So let's assume that now this patient with a normal heart, okay, so normal ven left ventricular size. So this patient has developed a uh, heart failure problem. So heart failure problem in the sense initially his ejection fraction, the ventricular ejection fraction, instead of 70%, it has dropped to 55%. So during that stage, if the patient won't take ACE inhibitors, if the patient won't take ACE inhibitors regularly, then after a few months or after one year, what happens is his ejection fraction will further drop from 55 to 45 or 40 percent. And at the same time, his left ventricle, it changes its shape. So the left ventricle will undergo hypertrophy. That is, it will increase in the size. Okay. And when once it increases in the size, okay, so it loses its elastic contractile property. Okay. So that's what we'll study in case of uh, Frank Sterling's law. When a rubber band is stretched, okay, it will recoil. It will come back to normal size. But if we stretch the rubber band to a larger extent, or if we keep on stretching the rubber band to uh, larger extent for um, more than like uh, five to ten minutes then what happens that rubber band it loses its recoiling property it won't recoil it won't come back to its normal size so that's what it happens with the left ventricle it has got completely stretched so it means that it won't it won't undergo a forceful contraction it won't uh, it won't, the muscles, the cardiac myocytes, they won't recoil properly. Okay. They have lost their elastic recoiling nature. Okay. So that's what it happens if we won't put the patient on an ACE inhibitor. If the patient won't take the ACE inhibitors in long term, it leads to cause the cardiac remodeling. So ACE inhibitors, they prevent the cardiac remodeling. So not only ACE inhibitors, but also beta blockers. Beta blockers are also one of the most important drugs in heart failure. So beta blockers also, they prevent such cardiac remodeling. And not only the beta blockers, even spironolactone, which is a aldosterone antagonist, it also shows the same property. It also has the same property. That is, it prevents cardiac remodeling. That is, it prevents left ventricular hypertrophy and prevents the development of further cardiac arrhythmias. So why arrhythmias develop here? What is the reason why the heart uh, rate will increase? So the reason here is, okay. so here you see the left ventricle has enlarged. It has undergone hypertrophy. Okay. It has uh, got enlarged. So it means that this left ventricle has failed the forceful contracting property. It is not undergoing a proper systole, that is contraction. So when, when it is not undergoing a proper contraction, then obviously the blood won't be pumped out into the iota properly. Only 35% of the blood is, let's assume that only 35% of the blood is pumping out. Instead of 70%, only 35% is pumping out. That is, it has dropped up to 50% of the total ejection fraction. So only 35% of the blood is pumping out. So now what happens is due to the lack of proper oxygen supply to the tissues, okay. so as only 35% of the blood is pumping out, only 35% of the blood is reaching to all the organs of the body. So less oxygen is uh, reaching to all the organs in the body, then immediately the sympathetic system gets activated. Sympathetic system will recognize that low blood flow. Okay? And sympathetic system will activate and it will keep on releasing noradrenaline. Okay? So it will keep on releasing noradrenaline. So we know that when once the noradrenaline is released, noradrenaline will show the action on the beta-1 receptors on the heart. And when once the beta-1 receptors get activated with more noradrenaline, then the heart rate will increase. Okay. So heart rate will keep on increasing. So it will keep on increasing, increasing, increasing from 70 
beats per minute, which is normal uh, heart rates, 70 to 80 beats. From there, the heart rate, it may go up to 300 beats per minute or 400 beats per minute. Okay, So that condition is known as the arrhythmias, ventricular arrhythmias, ventricular tachycardias. Okay, So which may lead to cause the death of the patient again. Okay. So that what it happens. Okay, so if left ventricle, if it undergoes the hypertrophy, then obviously the cardiac output will decrease. When the cardiac output is decreased, then sympathetic system will get overactivated. Now the sympathetic system will keep on releasing noradrenaline, and that noradrenaline will increase the heart rate. And that heart rate sometimes it may go even up to 400 beats per minute. That is the left ventricular fibrillation occurs, and it leads to cause the death of the patient okay so that's why if we put the patient on a ACE inhibitor and if we put the patient on a beta blocker or if we put the patient on a spironolactone then all these drugs they prevent such cardiac remodeling or they prevent ventricular hypertrophy okay so by preventing all those conditions they prolong the life of the patient they prolong the survival of the patient okay so ace inhibitors arbs beta blockers aldosterone antagonists so all these drugs they prolong the survival of the patient okay now this is the mechanism of action of ace inhibitors uh, as we all know about this mechanism we have seen we have studied many times so ACE inhibitors, they mainly prevent the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Okay, So that's the mechanism of action of ACE inhibitors. Now, regarding the side effects of ACE inhibitors. So the first side effect is hyperkalemia. They increase the serum potassium levels. Whereas we know that diuretics, they cause hypokalemia. Diuretics, they decrease the serum potassium levels. And the second adverse effect of the ACE inhibitors is ACE inhibitor, they cause the rash and angioedema. And ACE inhibitor, they also cause the dry cough. So angioedema, dry cough, rash, all these side effects are due to increasing bradykinin levels in the body. So when we put the patient on ACE inhibitors, so what happens is ACE inhibitors, they, they block the or they prevent the hydrolysis or the degradation of bradykinins in the body. As a result, the bradykinin levels gets increased. So due to increase in the bradykinin levels, it leads to cause dry cough, angioedema, and rash, and other problems in the patient. And ACE inhibitors, they increase the serum creatinine levels. So increase in the serum creatinine levels is quite common. So whenever we put the patient on ACE inhibitors, then their serum creatinine level will definitely increase. So this increase is common. And increase up to 25% is acceptable. Okay. So up to 25% is acceptable. But if it keeps on increasing beyond that, then we need to um, stop giving ACE inhibitors to the patient. And all the ACE inhibitors are contraindicated in pregnancy. So we should never give ACE inhibitors in pregnant women. Then ARBs, that is the angiotensin II receptor blockers. So ARBs. Losartan, candisartan, elbisartan, telmisartan. So all these drugs, they share the same properties as that of the ACE inhibitors. They share the same side effects. They share the same properties as that of ACE inhibitors, except dry cough. ACE inhibitors, they cause the dry cough, whereas ARBs, they won't cause any dry cough. And in patients, those who develop the dry cough with ACE inhibitors, then the doctors, they will switch them over to the angiotensin II receptor blockers. Okay. Now, the next class of the drugs are the beta blockers. So beta blockers, examples are besoprolol, metoprolol, carbidilol. Okay. So these beta blockers, only BMC, that is besoprolol, metoprolol, and carbidilol are the drugs that can be used in heart failure. Okay. And that to metoprolol, not the immediate release, only the sustained release metoprolol is the drug of choice in heart failure. Okay. Then always beta blockers are to be used in combination with ACE inhibitors in the management of heart failure. And these two drug combinations, ACE inhibitors plus beta blocker combination is considered as the first line agents in the management of heart failure. 
Okay. If ACE inhibitors are contraindicated, we can replace it with ARBs, ARB plus beta blockers. These two combination is considered as the first line in heart failure. And the most important point here is we should not initiate a beta blocker until the patient is stable. That is hemodynamically, the patient is stable. Or we should not give a beta blocker to the patient when the heart is in a decompensated state. Okay. So we need to start giving the beta blocker only when once the heart, it comes back to a compensated state. Okay. So it means that when that excess fluid, which is present in the body, it should uh, be removed out from the body first. Then only we need to start the patient on a beta blocker. Okay. So what happens if the heart is in a decompensated state? And on top of that, if we start beta blocker to the patient, okay, then we know that beta blockers, they also have got a negative inotropic property. That is, they reduce the force of contractions. Okay. So as a result, the patient heart uh, cardiac output will further decrease the patient becomes hypotensive and other complications will arise so that's why beta blockers are life-saving drugs of course they are the life-saving drugs but we should not start the beta blockers like uh, abruptly we should not start the beta blockers so we need to start a beta blocker carefully when once the heart it comes back to a compensated condition or when once that excess fluid is removed from the body or when once the patient is hemodynamically stable then only we need to start the patient on a beta blocker now the advantages of the beta blockers are again the same beta blockers also prevent the cardiac remodeling that's what we have seen with ace inhibitors okay. and the beta blocker they have a capacity to prevent or to regress left ventricular or the vascular hypertrophy. So that's why beta blockers are considered as the first line drugs in patients with almost all the cardiovascular problems. Like if the patient has hypertension with myocardial infarction, hypertension with congestive heart failure, hypertension with any coronary artery disorders, like um, angina pectoris, okay? then beta blockers are to be considered as the first line agents because beta blockers, they have a cardioprotective property. Then the next class of the drugs are the aldosterone antagonist. The examples for aldosterone antagonist are spironolactone and eflirinone. So these two drugs are aldosterone antagonist. Now, why do we need to give this aldosterone antagonist? So first of all, what is aldosterone? So aldosterone is the hormone which is released by the adrenal gland, adrenal cortex. It releases the mineralocorticoid and the name of that mineralocorticoid is known as the aldosterone. So its name itself, it indicates that it is a mineralocorticoid. So its major function is it keeps on reabsorbing the sodium and water into the body. So aldosterone, it al always it reabsorbs the sodium and water uh, at the collecting duct of nephrons into the systemic circulation, that is into the bloodstream. So as a result, aldosterone, it increases the extracellular fluid volume, it increases the cardiac preload. And aldosterone, it also causes the fibrotic changes in the myocardium, like worsening of the systolic dysfunction and pathological remodeling. Again, aldosterone on, when aldosterone keeps on uh, acting on the heart, it leads to cause the cardiac remodeling. That is left ventricular hypertrophy may occur with the continuous action of the aldosterone in the body. So what happens here is if we give an aldosterone antagonist, okay, so that is the spironolactone, which is a weak diuretic and it is also a potassium sparing diuretic. Okay? So if we put the patient on aldosterone antagonist, then the aldosterone antagonist will block these functions. And aldosterone antagonist, that is the spironolactone, will prevent the left ventricular hypertrophy. Okay, so that's the advantage of aldosterone antagonist, that is spironolactone. Okay, and the main drawback or the side effect of the spironolactone is they cause the hyperkalemia because the name itself it indicates that they are potassium sparing diuretics. They reabsorb the potassium into the, they conserve more potassium into the body. Okay, so serum potassium levels gets increased and the patient become hyperkalemic. 
And spironolactone, it also has got another major side effect that is gynecomastia. So epilidinone is the drug which is free of this side effect. So whenever the patient, they develop any gynecomastic symptoms, then we need to switch, switch the patient over to the epilidinone. So that's about allosterone antagonist, that is the spironolactone. And again, when do we need to use this allosterone antagonist? That is when we need to give spironolactone to the patient. So spironolactone is to be given to the patient when the combination of ACE inhibitor and the combination of the beta blocker, the both the drug combinations, when they fail to show the action, then we will add spironolactone to the therapy. So right at the beginning, like we won't use spironolactone as the first line agent. So we always uh, reserve the spironolactone when once the combination of ACE inhibitors and the beta blockers, they fail to show proper improvement, then we will add the spironolactone. Then the next class of the drug, the last one, and the most important one is digoxin. So digoxin, it is a cardiac glycoside. So we know that digoxin, it has got a positive inotropic property. So it means that it increases the force of contraction. And the main uh, mechanism of action of the digoxin is it uh, shows the action at the sodium potassium ATPS pump. So it uh, shows the action at that pump and it increases the indirectly, it increases the calcium levels. And due to the increase in the calcium levels, it leads to cause contractions in the cardiac myocyte. So in this diagram, we can have a look through the mechanism of action of digoxin. So digoxin, it shows the action at the sodium potassium ATPS pump. So this pump is the sodium potassium ATPS pump. So digoxin, it, so first of all, let's have a look through what is the function of this pump. So through this pump, there will be three sodium ions, the intracellular sodium ions, three intracellular sodium ions will get flexed out and in exchange to the three sodium ions, two potassium ions will inflex into the cell. Okay? So three sodium gets flexed out and two potassium will enter into the cell. So this is the function of the sodium potassium ATPS pump. Now, digoxin, if we give the patient digoxin, then digoxin will go and bind to this pump and digoxin will block this pump. So when this pump is blocked up, then the intracellular sodium, it won't get flexed out. Okay. As a result, the sodium concentration within the cell gets increased. When that sodium concentration gets increased, we know that in order to develop an action potential, the main ions which are required are sodium ions. So when that sodium concentration is getting increased, then an action potential will develop. And these sodium ions, they also stimulate the calcium ions, which are stored inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So they also stimulate the calcium ions. Sorry, they also stimulate the release of calcium ions from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And when once these calcium ions are released, the calcium ions, they bind with the actin and myosin filaments. And when once uh, they bind with the actin and myosin filaments and forms the cross bridges between actin and myosin filaments. As a result, it leads to cause the contraction of the cardiac myocyte. So in this way, digoxin indirectly, it is increasing the calcium levels, which helps in contracting the cardiac muscle. So digoxin, it causes the positive inotropic property. That is, it helps in increasing the force of contractions. Okay. And there are two uh, things that mainly interacts with the digoxin. One is the potassium levels okay so and the uh, like the potassium levels we can categorize it into uh, increase in serum potassium and decrease in serum potassium levels okay so these two are the factors that mainly they interact with the serum digoxin concentration so increase in serum deox uh, potassium levels is known as hyperkalemia whereas decrease in serum potassium levels is known as hypokalemia okay so what happens exactly here is so digoxin and potassium, they both fight together to bind with the sodium potassium ATPS pump. Okay. So if digoxin levels are more, okay, if digoxin is stronger, then digoxin will bind with this pump and 
it blocks the sodium potassium ATPs pump. It means the digoxin will prevent the efflux of the sodium ions. But on the other hand, if potassium concentration is higher, okay, so in case of hyperkalemia, what happens here is potassium will fight with digoxin. Okay, and as we know that potassium levels are higher, potassium will win. Okay, so it will bind with the pump and potassium will get inflexed and sodium will come out. It means that in case of hyperkalemic condition, the digoxin's therapeutic effect will get decreased. Okay, so in case of hyperkalemia, the digoxin's therapeutic effect will decrease. On the other hand, in case of hypokalemia, that is when potassium concentration is low. So now what happens here is digoxin will bind okay, and more amount of the digoxin will bind and digoxin will keep on showing the action and it may go to it or it may reach to toxic levels okay so hypokalemia will lead to cause excess digoxin of action and sometimes it may also show the toxic effects of digoxin whereas hyperkalemia will decrease the digoxin actions okay and it shows a subtherapeutic effect of digoxin okay then this is the most important thing that you guys need to know uh, regarding digoxin. So the accepted therapeutic range of digoxin is 0 0.5 to 2 micrograms per liter. But ideally, so in most of the elder patients and those who have this renal impairment issues, okay, so our target range will be 0 0.5 to 0 0.8 micrograms per liter. Okay. Because in most of the cases, when once the serum uh, target levels the digoxin target levels, even if it reaches to 1.2, then immediately the patient, they will start showing the side effects, the toxic effects of digoxin. So that's why we'll never target up to two. Okay, So always our target is 0 0.5 to 0.8 micrograms per liter. Now, let's have a look through what are the toxic uh, effects of this digoxin. So when once the digoxin levels, then, uh, it reaches to the toxic range that is even if it goes up to 1.2 then immediately the patients they will start developing the symptoms okay, the toxicity symptoms and the main toxicity symptoms the first symptoms that can be seen are the gastrointestinal symptoms okay. so the gastric symptoms are the first symptoms like nausea anorexia vomiting so these are the first signs of digoxin toxicity okay. and after developing the dogs, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, later the patient will develop the cardiac symptoms, like cardiac arrhythmias. Okay, So these are the uh, common toxic side effects of digoxin. And usually the digoxin's steady state concentration will be reached after seven days. In case if the patient has a normal renal function, then it takes at least seven days to reach the steady state concentration. Okay. And in case if the patient has the renal impairment, then it may take longer time. Okay, instead of seven days, it may go even up to 14 days or 15 days to reach the steady state concentration. Okay, so the half life of digoxin is 36 hours. And for any drug to reach the steady state concentration, it needs at least four to five half lives. Okay, let's take five half lives, five times 36 hours, okay, roughly around it takes seven days for the drug to reach the steady state concentration. So it means that we measure the therapeutic levels of digoxin. We'll take the sample and measure the digoxin levels only when once the digoxin reaches the steady state concentration. So before that, we should not measure the steady state concentration of digoxin. Okay, And that too, we need to take the blood sample at least six hours after the dose to allow proper distribution of the digoxin. So after giving the digoxin dose, we need to wait at least six hours for the drug to get distributed. Then only we need to collect the serum sample. So these are a few important points that are related to the digoxin. And all these points are mainly related to, to the uh, target or therapeutic range of digoxin. Okay. So finally, this is the overview of the topic, guys. So from this slide, we can come to know that 
what class of the drugs are to be considered as the first line agents in the management of congestive heart failure. So whenever the patient they present with uh, heart failure problems, heart failure symptoms. So the first drugs, first line drugs that we need to give to the patient are the ACE inhibitors, okay? like enalapril, lisinopril, ramipril, perintopril, all are the ACE inhibitors. If ACE inhibitors are contraindicated, then we can give ARBs. Okay? But ACE inhibitors or ARBs are considered as first line agents. And along with ACE inhibitors, so we must also give beta blockers to the patient. Always we must combine beta blockers with ACE inhibitors. And the most important point that I mentioned uh, earlier was, so we should not give beta blocker to the patient when the heart is in a decompensated state. So we need to wait until the heart comes back into a compensated state. Okay? Then we can start the patient on a beta blocker. Okay? So ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, these two are the mandatory drugs. Then diuretics. So diuretics, they also play a major role in heart failure. So diuretics are to be given only when required. Whenever the patient has congestion or whenever the patient has the fluid overload, then only we'll give diuretics to the patient. Okay? Otherwise, we won't give diuretics to the patient. Then spinolactone. Spinolactone, which is an aldosterone antagonist, okay? and it is also a potassium sparing diuretic. So this spinolactone is to be added to the initial therapy, initial therapy in the sense, a combination of ACE inhibitor and beta blocker therapy. So spinolactone is to be added to the initial therapy where the first line agents, they fail to show improvement in symptoms. So here the first line agents are ACE inhibitors plus beta blocker combinations. So if they fail to show the uh, implementing the symptoms, then we can put the patient on spinolactone. And always digoxin. Digoxin is always considered as the last option where the ejection fraction is too low okay, or there is a minimal response with the initial therapy, then only we need to put the patient on digoxin. Okay. So because we know that digoxin, it won't uh, help in prolonging the survival of the patient. And in long term, if we put the patient on a digoxin for a long term and at the uh, higher doses, then what happens is, so the only function of the digoxin is to improve the pumping of the heart. So that's the only role of digoxin. It will keep on uh, increasing the force of contractions. So it will keep on increasing the pumping of the heart. Okay. So what happens is, in long term, like if the patient is on digoxin at a higher doses for a uh, long term, that is for two years or three years, then what happens is after pumping, uh, like after continuous uh, systoles or the continuous increase in uh, positive inotropic property, so the ventricles, they undergo hypertrophy. The ventricles, they become uh, hypertrophic in nature. Okay, So that's why we'll never try to put the patient on digoxin as a first line. And also when we put the patient on digoxin, so we always try to make sure that we need to reduce the dose to as small as possible. Okay? And we should not put the patient on digoxin for a long term. Okay? So these are the few uh, important take home points related to the congestive heart failure. So, so far we have seen about uh, the heart failure and its management and also we have seen about each and every class of the drugs that can be used in uh, the management of heart failure and this is the last slide that we have covered so this is the overview of the drugs that can be used in the management of heart failure so now let us try to apply what will be the things that we have learned okay try to apply our knowledge okay and uh, let's see and you can test your knowledge by yourself in the form of a case scenario. So we are going to have a look through the case scenario so through which you can test your knowledge. So first of all, Mr. JR, a 67-year-old male, he presented to the clinic with a new onset of mild dyspnea. Dyspnea is nothing but shortness of breath. Okay. So And this dyspnea is only on exertion. That is, whenever he does some sort of activity, then he is developing this shortness of breath. He has a past medical history of GERD or GERD, which is gastroesophageal reflex disorder, hypertension, osteoarthritis, and diabetes. 
So his current medications include, he's on pantoprazole 40 milligram, diltiazem 60 milligram, paracetamol one gram four times a day, metformin 500 gram BT, and pioglitazone 15 milligram daily. So these are the medications the patient is currently for his medical conditions. So for gastroesophageal reflux disorder, he's on pantoprazole. So for hypertension, he's on diltiazem. And for osteoarthritis, for the pain management, he's taking paracetamol regularly. And for diabetes, he's on metformin and pioglitazone. So his chest X-ray was clear, no peripheral edema. And he has been diagnosed with the stage two heart failure. So usually this heart failure, we can categorize into stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four. Again, based on the severity of the heart failure. So based on the severity of the ejection fraction, how like how much percentage of the ejection fraction has been decreased. So we'll tell it as the stages. We'll categorize it into stages of the heart failure. So this is the uh, complete medication, uh, complete medical history and the medication uh, history of the patient. Okay, so the patient is on cu currently on these medications. So now the doctor in the ward asks the pharmacist. So if you are the pharmacist in the uh, ward, okay, so the doctor has asked you to reconcile the patient's current drug therapy. Okay, so the uh, doctor has asked you to go through uh, all the medications and ask to reconcile the therapy. So here you need to identify if there are any of the medications that may precipitate the heart failure or any of the medications that are the risk factors for the patient for this heart failure. So you need to identify those medications. Okay. So from the topic, what we have learned so far, so we have learned that there are certain medications that may lead to cause heart failure in the patient, that may uh, precipitate the heart failure conditions. And the medication that may precipitate the heart failure are calcium channel blockers, okay, thiazolidinidiones, and uh, anthracycline antibiotics, and certain medications like corticosteroids uh, and NSAIDs. So all these drugs, they may precipitate the heart failure. So in the current medication, the patient is currently taking you know, the current home medications. If we have a look, the patient is on diltiazem. So diltiazem is a calcium channel blocker. So we know that diltiazem, it has got a negative inotropic property, it decreases the force of contraction. So that's why it is one of the main risk factors for this patient. And the other drug, pioglitazone. So pioglitazone is a thiazolidinidione. So pioglitazone, one of the side effects is it causes fluid retention in the body. And it is also one of the main risk factors to this patient. Okay. So here you have identified as a pharmacist, we have identified these two are the main problems. And then the doctor, they have replaced his pioglitazone with glycazide and they have replaced his deltiazem with lisinopril. Okay. So now the patient is on pantoprazole. He's on lisinopril, paracetamol, metformin and glycoside. Okay. So we have started the patient on lisinopril. So lisinopril is an ACE inhibitor, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. Okay. So that is the first medication that we have started to this patient. Now, after starting the lisinopril, what parameter that we need to monitor? So do we need to monitor serum sodium, potassium, calcium, or phosphate levels? So we know that when once we start the patient on lisinopril, that is the ACE inhibitor, so we must monitor serum potassium levels because ACE inhibitors, one of the side effects of ACE inhibitors is they cause the hyperkalemia. So we need to keep on monitoring the serum potassium levels of the patient. Then the HMO, HMO is nothing but the junior doctors, they asked your advice, the pharmacist advice, to recommend one of the below mentioned drugs to optimize the JR's therapy, to optimize further optimize the patient's therapy. Like already the patient is on ACE inhibitor. Now the doctor, they are asking to add another medication. So if we need to add one more drug, so which drug do we select? Okay. So we got different drugs here. We got digoxin, we got spironolactone, nifidipine, furosemide, am amiodarone, candesatin, and besoprolol. Okay. So which drug do we need to go? So we need to go with besoprolol because besoprolol is a beta blocker. So always remember in the previous slide, we have seen that 
at first we need to put the patient on ACE inhibitor and beta blocker. So these two are mandatory medications okay? because they both have got a cardioprotective property. They both prevent further ventricular uh, hypertrophy. Okay, So we must put the patient on a beta blocker. Already the patient is on lisinopril. Okay, So now we have started bisoprolol. Lisinopril and bisoprolol, that is ACE inhibitor plus beta blocker combination. Then let's see what happened later on. Okay. So Mr. JR, the patient, he got discharged with lisinopril 10 milligram and bisoprolol 2.5 milligram once a day. After two weeks, the patient presented with a complaint of severe dry cough. Now identify the cause of his dry cough and recommend an alternate therapy. So what could be the cause of the dry cough for this patient? that is ACE inhibitor. Okay, So lisinopril is the drug that leads to cause the dry cough. So now we need to switch over to another class of the drug. If we are switching over to another class of the drug, so the drug that we need to select among the given list is candisatin because candisatin is an example for ARB. Okay, So we need to switch from lisinopril to ARB. So now the patient is on lisinopril, the patient is on candisatin and the patient is on all the other medications like he's on pantoprazole, metformin, paracetamol and glycoside. So we are not considered much about the other medications because we are not going to um, we are not going to change or we are not going to uh, touch the other therapy of the patients. So we are mainly concerned about the current therapy that is heart failure therapy. Okay, So the patient is on candisatin and besoprolol. Now, what happened? After one month of initiating the candisatin and bisoprolol, candisatin 8 milligram and bisoprolol 2.5 milligram, so Mr. JR, the patient, he presented to the hospital with a problem of mild ankle swelling. Okay. So mild ankle edema. So here you can see that there is an ankle swelling. Okay. So now what we need to do? Okay. So identify the drug which suits best for this patient at this stage. So among the given drugs, so which drug will help to remove that excess fluid from the body? Okay. So we know that the best drug that we can go is furosemide. So furosemide is the drug that can help to remove the excess fluid from the body. Okay. So what happened? Mr. JR has been prescribed with the furosemide 20 milligram once daily in the morning for his ankle edema. And he has been advised to take furosemide only when he has severe when he has an issue of ankle swelling. Like the doctors, they have uh, asked the patient to take in case if the patient has that swelling, then they ask the patient to take. And if there is no swelling, if there are no symptoms, then he can stop using the furosemide. That is, furosemide can be used as on-off basis. And after eight months, he represented with worsening of symptoms. So initially, he is on candisatin and bisoprolol and is also using the furosemide like whenever required okay so he's taking the furosemide as well but after eight months he presented to the hospital with a worsening of symptoms so his medical team identified the issues and decided to further optimize his drug therapy so now we need to add another drug to this patient okay so they increased the dose of the bisoprolol so already they have increased the dose of beta blocker so in while optimizing the drug therapy in heart failure, always remember that. So we must try to put the patient on a beta blocker at the higher dose as the, the, there is the dose which is tolerable by the patient. Okay, So as high as possible and that dose should be tolerable by the patient. So from 2.5 milligram, now they have increased it to 5 milligram. And candisatin from 8 milligram, they have increased it to 32 milligram once daily. So apart from optimizing the dose of beta blocker and ARBs, that is increasing the dose of beta blocker and ARBs, is there any other thing that you can recommend? That is there anything, any other thing that you can add further to this therapy? Okay. So the patient is on bisoprolol, the patient is on candisatin, but still the patient is developing the worsening of symptoms. So what we can do now? So the best thing is we need to add another drug okay? and that drug is nothing but spironolactone. So we need to put the patient on a spironolactone. 
Okay, because already they have increased, they have optimized the dose of bisoprolol and candesartan. So now the time is to add spironolactone. Okay, so finally the patient is now the patient is on uh, candesartan, the patient is on bisoprolol, the patient is on spironolactone, and he's also taking frucimide. So whenever he's getting this edema or uh, fluid accumulation. So then the patient is also taking frucimide. Okay. So now let's see what happened. Okay. So after starting the spironolactone, so which electrolyte level should be monitored? So we know that spironolactone, it increases the serum potassium levels. So the electrolyte that we need to monitor is the potassium. Okay. Then Mr. JR finally got discharged with a newly added spironolactone 25 milligram to his ongoing first line therapy ongoing first line therapy in the sense so the patient is on candesartan and bisoprolol so to that candesartan and bisoprolol as in the previous slide we have seen that we have added spironolactone okay so after adding the spironolactone that is after 2 years he presented to the emergency department with severe shortness of breath he always prefers to sit upright position in a chair so what happens with heart failure patients is when once they lie on the bed, okay, then they can't breathe properly. They will develop the shortness of breath. So that's why in order to breathe properly, always they will keep on increasing the pillows okay, in order to elevate their head. Okay, so they will put two pillows, three pillows okay, to elevate the head. And sometimes if the condition is severe, then always they prefer to sit in a chair rather than lying on the bed. Okay. So that's the condition here. The patient is always, he prefers to sit upright in a chair due to dyspnea, that is shortness of breath. And when a chest x-ray was taken, chest x-ray, it revealed that severe fluid in the lungs, that is a hydrothorax condition was formed. So his left ventricular ejection fraction has been dropped to 30%. Okay. So decrease in the left ventricular ejection fraction to 30% is considered as a severe condition. Okay. So the doctors, they have started giving IV frucimide, 80 milligram BD. Already the patient is getting the IV frucimide, 80 milligrams, okay, to remove that excess fluid from the lungs. Okay. And at this stage, if you want to recommend any medication, so which medication do you recommend? Okay. So again, the same uh, scenario which is presented here. And at this stage, which medication would be the best option to start? Okay. So we know that already the patient is on candesartan, patient is on bisoprolol, patient is on spironolactone, and he's also taking frucimide. Okay. So the best medication that we need to recommend here is tejoxin. Okay. Because ejection fraction has is getting low. So we need some inotropic drug. Okay, so which can pump the heart. Okay, so we need to start the patient on digoxin at this stage. And remember that nifedipine, which is a calcium channel blocker. So usually calcium channel blockers are not to be used in heart failure condition. So we need to cross the nifedipine. And amiodarone. Amiodarone is the drug that is used only in cardiac arrhythmias. So we never use amiodarone in heart failure unless the patient has got the heart failure associated with arrhythmias then we can give amiodarone. But here in this case, the patient doesn't have arrhythmias problem. So we, we are least bothered about amiodarone, so we can cross amiodarone. Okay. So here we need to start patient on digoxin. Then he has been started on 125 micrograms dose of digoxin once daily. After eight days of starting digoxin, he still complains of shortness of breath. The doctors decided to monitor his digoxin levels before increasing the further increasing the dose of digoxin. So when his serum digoxin levels were monitored, it was found that his serum digoxin level was 1.3 micrograms per ml. Okay, so actually it is not the uh, ml; it is the liters. Okay, so 1.5, sorry, 1.3 micrograms per liter, and the normal range of digoxin is 0 0.5 to 0 0.8 micrograms per liter. So here they have found that already the serum digoxin levels is higher. Okay? So it has reached to 1.3 micrograms per liter. 
then they have done further investigations. Okay? So they have uh, done all the other blood tests and they have found that the patient's serum potassium level is elevated to 5.9 millimoles per liter. So the normal serum potassium level should be 3.5 to 4, 4.5. Okay? But here in this case, the patient's serum potassium levels have been elevated to 5.9. So we know that what is the main reason for increasing serum potassium levels in this patient. So the patient is on ARB. The patient is on candesartan. Okay. So the candesartan will increase the serum potassium levels. And also the patient is on spironolactone, which is also a potassium sparing diuretic. So these two are the risk factors. They both have increased the serum potassium levels. Okay. And we have seen that Whenever the serum potassium levels gets increased, okay, then what happens to the therapeutic effect of the digoxin? Okay? So the question here is the therapeutic effect of digoxin will be reduced by increasing serum potassium levels. So when the serum potassium levels gets increased, then the therapeutic effect of digoxin will get reduced. So that's what it happened here. So even though the patient's serum uh, like the levels are 1.3, but the therapeutic effect is reduced. So still the patient is developing shortness of breath, even though the patient is taking 125 micrograms of digoxin every day. Okay, Still he has the symptoms. Okay. And again, once again, the same slide that uh, we have seen before, the mechanism of action of digoxin and the interaction of the digoxin with potassium. So in case of hyperkalemia when the potassium concentration is low then potassium will bind with the sodium potassium ATPS pump and digoxin it can't bind with the pump it means that the therapeutic action of the digoxin on the cardiac myocytes will get reduced okay and finally identify the correct statement regarding digoxin so here are a few statements which are related to digoxin. So you guys need to identify which statement is the correct statement. So the first statement, it says that the therapeutic concentration of digoxin is 0 0.5 to 0.8 micrograms per ml. Okay. And then the second statement, it says that the dose above, the dose in the sense, the therapeutic concentration okay, uh, of digoxin above 2 micrograms per liter is occasionally toxic. And the third statement, it says that palpitations and other cardiovascular symptoms are the first line symptoms of digoxin toxicity. And the last statement, it says that wait at least six hours after dosing to monitor the plasma concentration of digoxin. Okay. So that is on day seven, when we monitor, when once the drug, it reaches the uh, steady state concentration. So they are saying that to wait at least six hours after dosing digoxin to monitor the plasma concentration. So among the four statements, so which statement do you consider is the correct statement? Okay. So the correct statement is need to wait at least six hours after dosing the digoxin to monitor the plasma concentration. Okay. So why not the other statements? So let's uh, go and have a look through the other options as well, like A, B, and C. Okay. So option A, it says that the therapeutic concentration of digoxin is 0 0.5 to 0 0.8 micrograms per ml. Okay. So it is not per ml, it is per liter. Okay. So I'm going back to the previous slide where we have mentioned about the important points related to digoxin. So in this slide, you can see that uh, the therapeutic concentration, it can be 0 0.5 to uh, 2 micrograms per liter, but more in most of the patients, we target to 0.5 to 0.8 micrograms per liter. Okay, so it is per liter, not per ml. Okay, so if it is per ml, then it will be more toxic. Already it has reached to the severe toxic levels. Okay, so the concentration is 0 0.5 to 0.8 uh, micrograms per liter. So the first statement is incorrect statement. And the second statement, the plasma concentration above 2 micrograms per liter is occasionally toxic. Okay. So which is an incorrect statement again, because the plasma concentration 
of even up to 1.2 or 1.3 micrograms per liter is considered as toxic. Okay, so here they are saying that occasionally toxic. No, it is a wrong statement. Then the statement three it says that palpitations and other cardiovascular symptoms are the first line symptoms of dioxin toxicity. No, gastrointestinal symptoms like nausea, vomiting, anorexia are the first line symptoms of dioxin toxicity. And the statement D says that after uh, giving the drug that is digoxin, we need to wait at least six hours for the drug to get distributed in the body. Then only we need to monitor the plasma digoxin concentration. Okay, So that's the correct statement. So we need to wait at least six hours after giving the dose of digoxin okay? uh, before we monitor the plasma drug concentration. Okay. So that's it, guys. Thank you so much. So uh, we'll continue the other topic in our next lecture. So this is the end of heart failure. Okay. So thank you.